7. This matter is on today for sentencing. General, you wish to proceed? Yeah, we do. We did have a prior argument. Uh, we did have a big impact testimony. I don't know if your honor wants that. Uh, before we introduce um, the certified copies of the prior conviction. Um, let's introduce the any testimony from witnesses and uh, get uh, I usually do the impact statements uh, after we, after the evidence is presented. Okay. And then the very last thing uh, we do before the sentencing is the uh, allocation of the reason. Yeah, we could, um, we have submitted a sentencing uh, program.
we can make Exhibit 3 a certified copy of the conviction in Document Number 57240, the fourth count, wherein Mr. Boyd was found guilty of the lesser included count of robbery. That's a Class C, is in Charlie felony. The date of offense is April 21st, 1994, and he was convicted on April 11th, 2003. We can make count three, or exit three, certified copy of document number 57240, count three, where he was convicted. With an offense date of April 21st, 1994. Date of convictions April 11th, 2008. So for the record, count four, the victim is Dan Brand Bradshaw, according to the indictment. And count three, the victim is Michael Keaton. We can make count five, uh, exhibit five, a certified copy of document, document number 57240. The first count wherein Mr. Boyd was found guilty of the lesser included count of robbery. Date of offense is April 21st, 1994. Date of conviction is April 11th, 2003. The victim in that count is going to be Dean Stewart.
Make Exhibit 13 a certified copy of the indictment, document number 56299, where Mr. Boyd was charged July term 1994 with the aggravated robbery of George Ryan, an employee of the James E. Liberty School, that he did take by violence and by putting George Ryan in fear uh, by use of a deadly weapon to take property from George Ryan. And we can make Exhibit 14, a certified copy of the conviction, document 56299, where Mr. Boyd played guilty to the lesser count of robbery. The date of offense is March 28, 1994, and Mr. Boyd was convicted on April 11, 2003. Your Honor, we believe those prior convictions and the indictments uh, establish that Mr. Boyd is a career offender. Uh, we also would like to introduce uh, for purposes of uh, consecutive sentencing, for, for purposes of our argument for consecutive sentencing, uh, a certified copy of Mr. Boyd's federal judgment in case number 3, colon 00, I'm sorry, 3, colon 07 dash CR dash 03 dash 003. Wherein Mr. Boyd was convicted in federal court, accessory after the fact of carjacking, carjacking resulting in death in count one, and misprison of a felony in count two. Uh, judgment was entered on October 15, 2008. And the last exhibit that we're going to seek to introduce will be photographs of the victim. My name is Hugh Newsom. I'm the father of Christopher Newsom. I live at 3414 Bowl Meadows Court in Knoxville, Tennessee. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of my deceased son. I, I want to talk to you a minute about how we reacted to all of the grief. We were relegated to embracing a black body bag as our farewell to our son due to him being mutilated and tortured and his body in such a disarray that the funeral director would not allow us to see him. We begged, Mary begged to see him and the funeral director refused to let us see him. I hope none of you are ever subjected to something like this. It's demoralizing, it's hurtful, it leaves something in your mind that you can never fully get rid of. I hope that none of you ever have to go through that. I remember Mary <coughs> saying, as we were standing in the funeral home there with the body bag, Chris, we'll get whoever did this to you. As long as we live, we'll hunt, we'll do the, every legal 
means we can to bring that person to trial. And we have fought the last 12 years in bringing that about. How it's affected our family, we had one of our kids in their impact statement from an earlier trial say she not only lost a brother, but she felt she had lost her parents also. When you look at grandkids with tears rolling down their cheeks, saying, we miss Uncle Chris so much, that hurt is multiplied many times by the parent, to the parent. Our two oldest grandkids were the first two to get to meet Shannon. Chris took them on a shopping trip and they were the first of the family that got to meet Shannon. And they still talk about it even to this day. We had friends that were affected almost as bad as we were. At Chris's funeral, there was a young lad that had worked with him at the motorcycle shop in Oak Ridge. His name was Travis. He was a black kid. He hitchhiked from Oak Ridge to Halls on the north side of Knox County to come to Chris's funeral. He came through the receiving line with big tears rolling down his cheeks. He said, <clears throat> I just wanted to come and say goodbye to Chris. He was one of the best friends I ever had. Chris was not a racist like some of the people that we've had to deal with are, and neither is the Newsom family. We have friends in the black community that has supported us every day of this effort to bring Eric Boyd to trial. We had help from a friend in San Francisco Several times we wanted to throw up our hands and quit because we got a lot of discouragement from some of the higher officials here in Knox County. But we had a friend in San Francisco, a retired lawyer that kind of kept us on course and he prepared several documents that we presented to the Attorney General's office in our arguments to push for prosecution. We also had another friend who showed up. <clears throat> he was the former sailmate of LaMarcus Davison. He's turned his life around. He's a renowned author now that works out of Memphis. He, he writes under the name of 6'4". That's because he's six foot four inches <laughs> tall. But we're thankful for what has taken place with the prosecutors that was assigned to this case. We had Leland Price, T.K. Fitzgerald, Phil Morton that did an excellent job by using George Thomas's testimony. We acknowledge the fact that he was quite helpful in bringing this about. We also acknowledge the fact that we had a jury that had enough common sense to listen to the argument that the prosecution made. And they drove home one particular statement that we had screamed as loud as we could for the last 12 years that must have rung a sounding in their ear as they went to decide the verdict. That saying that we use so many times, no car, no crime. It's simple mathematics. One person with a car with two wanting to carjack 
makes three dangerous people. And Your Honor, I hope that uh, those pictures before and after, you look at those when you make the deciding sentence. That I have never seen pictures of persons like that before in my life. Animals don't even do that to each other. But I'm closing my impact statement with a phrase we heard in a song the other day. We'll never get over the deaths of Chris and Shannon, but with the help of God, we'll get through it. Thank you very much. Yes. Who are we looking at? That's uh, Chris and his mother, Mary. Uh, did Chris like sports? He did. He, uh, sports. he played, uh, through, as he grew up, he played basketball, baseball, and even played some soccer. But he uh, excelled in baseball. Recognize this photograph here? That's Chris. And did Chris like wearing hats? Pardon? Oh, yeah. Hey, normally, that's unusual for him to wear it straight forward. It's normally turned around backwards. <laughs> here. That's Chris on, <clears throat> on one of his bikes. He, uh, he had training wheels on that, and uh, I was pushing him down through the yard, and uh, I said, something to him that says, be careful. And he says, he, he balanced it good and took off down the street and circled the subdivision and come back. And he says, I think you need to take these training wheels off of this bike. <laughs> so we did. That's Chris at Christmas time. That's, that's Chris. At the beach, he was having a ball there. That's one of the cherished pictures we have of him there. He decided to. Where was this taken at? Pardon? Where was this photograph taken? I taken that when we lived on Tressa Circle. I think Mary was doing the laundry at that time, and he decided to crawl in the laundry basket and maybe take a nap. <laughs> his, his graduation picture. His uh, Halls High School graduation with a cap and gown on. Uh, Knoxville Stars baseball at that time. That's Chris, one of his stuffed animals. An earlier baby picture. That's Chris. That's Chris too, I believe. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Mary Newsom.
Mr. Boyd, you're a poor excuse for a human being. You're despicable, worthless, an evil person, and you're a coward and act worse than an animal. The boy you killed loved life. He enjoyed helping people. He loved his family and friends. He had a job and was making a difference. He told us when we got older, he would take care of us. Now he's not here to do that. He was the last one able to continue carrying on our family name. You took that away from us along with a wedding and more grandchildren. Chris brought a lot of happy memories and nothing can take that away. You on the other hand could never see the light should never see the light of day. No one should ever have to go through what our families have been through. And that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Andrea Newsom Bowers. Chris was my brother. Okay. Uh, first of all, good morning. I want to, we're at the finish line here, and I think we need to give Eric Boyd the maximum sentence possible to keep him off the streets. He's a danger to our society. Let's, we've had these, this district attorney's office, law enforcement, multiple people have worked to bring justice to Shannon and Chris, and we need to finish this race. Um, so I'm asking for you to do the maximum sentence possible so he can never be on the streets again. And Eric, I don't think you deserve Mr. Boyd, but um, at the federal trial, I really, I wanted to speak to you because I never thought I would have an opportunity to do that again, because I really thought you had gotten away with murder. but. Lo and behold, justice did come around here on earth. I thought we'd have to wait uh, our lifetime with you getting, getting away with it. But you didn't, and you're not going to. And I told you then, and I'm going to tell you again, this isn't all the judgment you're going to have to face. Because someday you're going to leave this earth, and you're going to have to bow before God. And you're going to have to confess what you did. And it... I cannot even fathom how human beings can do what you did to Chris. It just, I just, it, I cannot wrap my head around it. And uh, recently I've heard you say that, or I saw it in the media reports that uh, you've called Lamarcus Davidson a savage animal. Well, you were convicted of hiding him. So I kind of go with this phrase, birds of a feather flock together. So. I consider you a savage animal as well. So enjoy the rest of your time behind bars. And Chris was my baby brother. I don't have much to say to you, Eric Boyd, that hasn't already been said. Um, what you took from our family can never, ever be replaced. Chris gave so much to our family, and I'm just sad for your parents. I'm sad for your mom. I'm sad for your siblings, that they have to live with what you've done. They have to live with the consequences of that. Um, Judge, I just, after listening to TK talk about what a career criminal he has been, I feel like the system has let us down. They have let our family down, and this man should have never been on the street to begin with. 
So I'm just asking for you to not let the next family down and for you to make sure that he never walks the street again. Because as is evident, he cares nothing about life. He cares nothing about anyone other than himself and meeting his own needs. Mr. Boyd, I hope that you never see the light of day. My name is Dina Christian. I'm Shannon's mother. Yeah, I do. This is a picture of Shannon and her brother Chase. What about here? That's Shannon with her, my dad, her granddaddy. And that's Shannon on the bottom right. And Kara in the middle was some other of their classmates. That's my two girls, Shannon and Kara. Again, they were inseparable, that's Shannon and Kara. And that's her daddy's dad, her papa. And that was at graduation, and that's Gary's mom and dad, my mom, Shannon, and then Gary and Chase. That was her senior prom. Again, her senior prom. And that was at graduation. That's her and her brother on her 21st birthday. And that's Shannon and Chase at Christmas. Again, Shannon and Kara. And that's Shannon and I. And that's her little baby rebel and Shannon on her senior prom. That's one of her little cousins and her. Another little cousin. Her and her brother. And that's Shannon and Chris. That's what they took. And then that's her daddy and Shannon and her papa. And that's me and my two kids, Shannon and her daddy. That's Shannon. That's Shannon cheerleading. And that's her playing around in the yard on Easter Sunday. Well, first of all, I think the four of us all did the same thing, but I made a promise to Shannon on that horrible day when they told us she was dead. And that promise was to get justice for all of those involved and convicted and off the streets. It's been 12 and a half years and you're no longer getting away with murder, Eric Boyd. Losing Shannon broke my heart. My heart will never be whole again. I see Shannon or what they left of her every day. Seeing your child thrown in the trash can like trash just never goes away. Or her eyes open laying on that slab in the coroner's office. I see those pictures and what y'all did every day of my life. You took my baby girl from me. You all showed no mercy or regard for human life. I'll never get to be the mother of a bride or get to see my four grandbabies. You took that away from me. For what? A car? Some money? Why didn't you just get a job like real people? 
You are pure evil, Eric Boyd, and you never deserve to walk the face of this earth. I was asked to talk about how this has changed my life. Put yourselves in the four parents' shoes for a moment. How would you feel if it was your child that you saw on those pictures that we had to endure? And we do endure from forever because they'll never go away. How do you think I feel? I see those pictures and what they left of my child, not the beautiful, smart woman she had become. You took her from me, her daddy, her brother, her family, and her friends. You took her from this world, and she and Chris both had something to provide this world. They were good people. They didn't try to take away the things that you did. They'll always be a void in my heart. You took away my best friend. Did it make you feel big when you and Davidson put guns to Shannon and Chris's heads? Well, you're not. You're just the scum of the earth. How do you feel now? You got caught, finally. You even had us threatened during your federal trial, but we didn't go away. It's time, Your Honor, for Shannon and Chris to get the justice they deserve. He's not rehabilitatable. The evidence proves that that TK showed today. If he were to walk the streets again, I would not only fear for my life, but your children's life, your grandchildren's life. He doesn't deserve to walk the streets. I miss my little girl every day. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. I'd hate to be you on the day I stand before God. Thank you. My name is Gary Christian, and I'm the father of the woman that you helped murder, Shannon Christian. Eric Boyd has absolutely no positive value in our society. Boyd is evil. And he's proud of that. Evil is on this earth to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We are at war with evil, and clearly evil is our enemy. Boyd as well as the entire existence of evil that seek us, will ultimately be judged by God. I selfishly will pray that judgment will come sooner than later. I assure anyone that can hear my words that God's judgment of evil will be just, severe, complete, and eternal. Lower forms of existence like Boyd that have served nothing but darkness their entire lives deserve nothing less 
than a zealous, vigilant form of justice. Someone like Boyd should never be allowed to inflict his devastation to any other innocent, unsuspecting individual ever again. Boyd is the epitome of a career criminal. He has no intention, no desire to ever show another human being anything that would ever resemble common decency. Do not steal. Do not rape. And do not harm a child. And do not kill. These are principles which every man of every faith should embrace. Those things should not be polite suggestions. They are all cause of evil behavior. And they are all examples of common decency. Anyone that ignores these principles should pay the ultimate cost. There are varying degrees of evil. The punishment given to Boyd should send a message, a warning, to all the others like him, and to the lesser forms of filth in our communities. They should not receive any measure of mercy from our judicial system. They should not ever be allowed to feed on innocent, hardworking, God-fearing, decent human beings in our society. Never again. Respect is something that can only be earned. You, Your Honor, certainly have earned that from me. Today, sir, I only ask you one thing. That is to please consider these facts as you prepare to sentence a rapist, a thief, and a murderer. I, sir, will never live past the pain of losing my daughter. I will never again be able to say I love you more to Shannon. And I will never hear my daughter argue with me the fact, indeed, that she loved me more. I will never dance with my daughter at her wedding. I will never be able to play with her children, my grandchildren. I will never see what my daughter would have accomplished in her lifetime. I, sir, may never be able to help my son find a way to make the pain and the anger go away from his eyes. Evil took my daughter from this life. God had to take 
her away from evil and bring her home to live with him in heaven way before her time. I get that. But I ask you today, sir, to realize that you can stop this evil this time from ever walking the streets of our world again. All of us, we will all be obliged and know you have helped make this world a better place. As for me and mine, the battle will go on. We will forever stay ready to do what is necessary to protect our loved ones and our families and our friends. The war, God's already won. He won it at Calvary. But the battle for us still goes on. It's a battle for souls. And we must continue to fight that battle. But I promise anyone that can hear my words, if we have to fight it, we will fight it well. We will never let anyone forget my daughter and the animals that destroyed her. I will never forget, as one of Chris Newsom's sister called you a savage beast, you nodding your head up and down and smiling. I promise you that. I told you in federal court, with that big grin on your face, that I would get you today. That promise I made you begins. And unlike someone else said, I don't think you're going to enjoy your days in prison. Not at all. And I hope I'm standing next to God when he makes his judgment on you and sentences you to hell. statement is on behalf of Shannon's brother Chase. He could not be here and has asked me to deliver this for him on his behalf. He just wants to say that he has lived with the anguish and heartache of losing his baby sister for the last 12 and a half years. He feels like he not only lost his baby sister, but he lost his best friend. 
He married when he and his wife got pregnant with their first child. He worried so much about what he would do, how he would handle if he was blessed enough to have a baby girl. What if she looked and done things like Shannon did? He didn't, but still, he sees his sister every day in both his wounds. And what upsets him and angers him the most is that his babies will never get the opportunity to meet and know their aunt. And they will never have those cousins to grow up and play with. And it angers me to know him. Sometimes I can still feel her and hear her. And when something special happens, I just want to pick up the phone and call her to let her know about it. And because of Eric Boy, I can't see I never will. I love her and I miss her every day. It never goes away, sometimes more than others. She was and always will be my baby sister. I was supposed to protect her. I never even had the opportunity to do so. And you are the reason I blame you. We're out and you will find your way back to the position once more. You don't deserve to live in jail or out of jail. And I ask you, Judge, for the maximum penalty that he deserves, which would be, which in my eyes, or at least not be able to be out and hurt anyone else. Truth and justice will prevail. Also, I have seen open chairs at tables. And um, an open uh, maid of honor way for her. And she wasn't able to stand up for her boyfriend or her sister. And worse than that, here and I will never be able to even experience for a marriage or be able to stand with or for. Robbery 
as it related to those eight separate victims for using force and or weapons to take money and property from those victims. Uh, in 2003, he uh, pled, ultimately pled guilty to the lesser offenses of robbery. But one of the judges, we all of them say, that the sentence actually started in 1994, and he got an effective 10-year sentence for those robberies. So by my calculation, anyway, those sentences ended in October of 2004. So think of that. He has committed eight robberies against eight separate victims. No job up to that point in time, which puts him in his 30s. He victimized eight victims, taken money from them. For what reason, we don't, do not know. And he's done 10 years in penitentiary because the judge said he had eight and a half years of jail credit when he pled guilty in 2003. So he did even a little bit more time and came out immediately on parole. But in any event, those sentences would have expired in October of 2004. All during that time as well, he is acknowledged by his own officials as a gangster disciple gang. So he comes out of prison after victimizing the same eight plus years, if not 15, from victimizing eight people. He comes out of gang member, and there was no record of any kind from that point forward until January 2007 of him doing anything meaningful at all in terms of employment, uh, in terms of just behaving generally. And so that for that two years plus, uh, he remains a gangster disciple that has on his resume, if you will, eight violent felony convictions. And he walked in the streets with that, uh, with that resume, if you will. And then we move forward to January 2007. This gangster disciple, being the oldest of this bunch of uh, folks that, that, that killed these two young people, and being a gangster disciple by his own admission, and I get that from the pre-sentence report where he admitted he was a gangster disciple but got out in his 40s. Well, if you do the math, that means when he was 35 in January 2007, he remained a gangster disciple after he came out of prison and did not did not renounce, according to him, we had no proof that he renounced his membership in the gang. He did that only when he went to federal prison, if he did that at all. So in 2007, in January 2007, by his own admission, he's a gangster disciple, walking around with no job and eight felony, violent felony convictions on his record. So we say that number two, the defender whose record of criminal activity is extensive. That's, that's on the eight convictions in the last few years. Um, but more importantly and lastly, number three, this defendant is a dangerous offender whose behavior indicates little or no regard for human life and no hesitation about committing a crime in which the risk of human life is high. And of course that is that factor is, is somewhat fact driven by these cases. And the proof the court I'm sure well remembers is that uh, Davidson and his buddies went to this defendant to begin this whole thing. And went to this defendant to get a ride over to where this defendant knew these idiots were going to carjack somebody and commit another violent crime for which he got eight on his record. He's the one that provided the transportation, provided the car, if you will, for the carjacking to be in. And he, as I said, he's the oldest of this at that point in time. And without hesitation, Without hesitation, gave these uh, guys the ride over there to commit a violent crime. Without hesitation, followed them back to Chipper Street after they'd been a carjacking and kidnapped. Without hesitation, walked these victims into the house on Chipper Street. Without hesitation, probably within a couple of hours, as the court may recall took command from Davidson to take Chris Newsom out of kill him. Without hesitation, bound him, walked him to that car, got into that car without hesitation, drove over, drove that vehicle over to, to the, near the railroad tracks 
without hesitation. Got it. Chris Newsom out of that car down the gag and walking over the railroad track. That's not counting whatever the torture that happened within that two or three hour period of time from the carjacking to put, to put bullets in the back of his head. But bullets in his body. Without hesitation, he did that. Without hesitation, he chose to return to where Shannon Christian was being bound, gagged, raped, tortured, thrown into the garbage can condition. Without hesitation, returned and calmly reported to Mr. Davis if done the words of that day. And without hesitation, chose to do whatever he did and allowed Miss Christian to, to remain in that bound gag state, raped, tortured some more, and for hours and hours and hours before she was finally, finally killed. That's the language of the statute. Everything he did was without hesitation. Everything he did was, was, was calm and composed. His actions were calm and composed. And that just tells you that he has absolutely no hesitation about committing crimes in this human life and style. And it establishes beyond the preponderance of the evidence, very convincing evidence, whatever standard court will require. That this man is a dangerous offender, and the length of sentences, the longest sentences that the court can give him, would be reasonably related to the severity of these offenses and will serve, hopefully, as a deterrent. That's, that's kind of a loose concept, even though how to do them serve as a deterrent. Uh, but uh, the, you know, if it had just been Mr. Newsom, Justified, obviously, in, in, in consecutive sentences there. They've got a life sentence, and the court should impose consecutive sentences for the crimes committed in this on top of the life sentence. But it's not just that in the court. I know in court in the past, it is, fortunately, it's, it's rare that there are two murder victims. Uh, but, uh, the, the court, in past cases, when there have been two victims of murder, uh, has had. Court, this court and other courts have imposed consecutive sentences of life when there are two victims. And in this case, springs for this. This is one of those cases. This hopefully is the only case that will, that will come before the Knox County judge ever again of this severity, this, this magnitude, this much torture, this much pain, this much suffering. Uh, if it, you know, arguably, if, if the, the two killings had occurred at the same time, you can find you can find something in that to know. We have a killing that, that, that occurred around midnight and, and then the torture went on and on and on with the other victims until several hours later there's another killing that this man is responsible for uh, pursuant to this jury verdict. So this is this is the, hopefully the rarest of cases where the, the maximum sentence that the court can impose is justified. You might say, what's the point? He's going to die in prison. Well, the statute doesn't, it doesn't talk about ages of defendants. It talks about their criminal history. It talks about their dangerousness. And that's what the court has to look at. And that's what the court has to focus on. So we're asking that the crimes committed against Chris Newsom and this court has not yet sentenced him to uh, be served consecutively to the life sentence for Mr. Newsom. And similarly, with the crimes committed against this Christian, the court did not get sentenced, be served consecutively to the life sentence already uh, rendered uh, uh, for her death, and that those sentences be consecutive to each other uh, for the torture uh, that these victims suffered. Uh, we, that's, that's just what this record calls for, and that's what we, that's what we ask for. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Obviously, Your Honor, there's two victims of the jury, Mr. Reynolds. We acknowledge that from the beginning, and we've talked about that. But how many times? I think we do need to start with the fact that consecutive sentences 
not to be voted for tenure. There have to be certain factors, and I know General Morton alluded to several of those. But I would like to point out that Mr. Boyd's criminal history, and that he's a career offender as far as how it's calculated um, in regards to the judgments that were entered. I can't argue with that. So the state also cited State versus Johnson, which we would agree. He says that the 24 hour rule does not necessarily apply to these areas that have their own exceptions, given the fact that these are robberies, these convictions. But I do think that we need to take into account that these all occurred in 1994, all those prior convictions uh, occurred in 1994 when he was 22 years old. It happened over the course of a couple of months. He was sentenced all at the same time, meaning that there was a series. He ultimately was arrested and held accountable for that. Certainly, uh, he pled guilty. There was some, uh, there was a delay. The reason there was a significant delay was is that uh, he originally agreed to one sentence. However, the uh, DA's office had made an agreement with him as to uh, some conditions for his agreement, which ultimately were not uh, met. And so he was able to withdraw that. His post-conviction was successful. That's why he was convicted in 2003. And the state made an agreement with him that he would serve 10 years for all those crimes and that he committed when he was 22 years old. Once he was released in 2003, uh, we do take great issue with uh, the way that General Morton and Shrew's employment history. Actually, if you look at his pre-sentence, he says that he worked at various temp agencies on and off between 2003 and 2007, not that he was committing crimes in, to, in furtherance of his livelihood, but he was working. And again, you come out with six felony convictions for robbery, you come out of prison, it's a little hard to get a job. But Mr. Boyd did go to the temporary agencies and did work. And that's what the pre-sentence report shows. And so I don't think that the state has met their burden to say that Mr. Boyd is a professional criminal who's known to devote his life to criminal acts. He committed a series of acts when he was 22 years old. He did 10 years in prison for those crimes. And he came out and he was working. The other convictions are for the federal cases are obviously related to this. And he's certainly not you know, contesting. He, from the beginning, he said, yes, I hit out Mr. Davis. And then when I found out what he had done, I cooperated with the law enforcement to get him arrested, which is exactly what happened. So as far as his federal uh, convictions, you know, again, I think those are related to these events here. So his criminal history is extensive, but again, it's these six convictions when he was 22 from 1990. So I think it's a little disingenuous to sit there and say that this guy is a career offender and needs to have consecutive sentence. In regards to uh, factor three, I guess here's where it comes down a little bit to the weight of the evidence, and obviously uh, the jury convicted Mr. Boyd based on a theory of criminal responsibilities, the, the argument that the state made. To the jury, and uh, the court signed off as 13th juror for that. Weight of the evidence obviously is more of a motion for new trial and something that we'll consider on another day, but I do think that it's clear uh, that there have been, from the beginning, differing versions of events about what happened in January of 2007, about who was involved. And from the beginning, Mr. Boyd has vehemently denied that he was involved in the acts that led to the death of Shannon Christian and Mr. Newsom. So, um, you know, General Morton standing here and talking about a you know, little hesitation to do this, a little hesitation to do that. And that comes down to, I guess, some of the testimony that we heard from Mr. Thomas. And it doesn't quite match up all the uh, different versions of events that have been 
presented in this court and other courts and all the trials that we've had between the two defendants. Obviously, the uh, jury put some weight into what Mr. Uh, Thomas had to say, but again, the state's main primary argument throughout the trial was that this was a criminal responsibility and that he's responsible for providing the ride that led to the abduction and I guess ultimately the murder of this Your Honor, you know, the easy thing to do is this crime is shocking. The easy thing to do is to simply say consecutive, we'll know order that Mr. Boyd has these sentences consecutive and we'll never see the light of that. But I, and again, we've heard, I don't want to sentencing factors and apply them in this case. And we're simply asking the court to apply them in a way that is fair. And he's going to get, you're going to be handing him out a 60-year sentence on the eight felonies anyways. We're simply asking for these to run concurrent with the life sentence that the court has already reported him to serve. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Sentencing is one of the hardest parts of this job. And in Tennessee, it's, it's not only difficult to try to figure out what's fair or appropriate, it's also just quite complicated. Uh, so I'm going to supplement uh, what I'm about to say with a written sentencing order.
with the possibility of parole for the murder of Christian Reeves, and he did sentence the defendant to life with the possibility of parole for the murder of Shannon Christian. The court does now order that the life sentence in count three for the murder of Shannon Christian will run consecutively to the sentence imposed in count one for the murder of Christopher Newsom. With respect to the remaining counts, the, uh, the, uh, the class A felonies, uh, in each of those, uh, in each A felony, the sentence will be 60 years as, uh, as as specified by our sentencing statute. The court will order that those A felonies will run concurrently with each other, but consecutively to the life sentence in count three. And in count three class <coughs> B felonies will be ordered to run concurrently. They'll either merge or run concurrently with each other but run consecutively to the sentences imposed in the Class A felonies. The total effective sentences, two life sentences stacked, plus 90 years. That will be the sentence. Thank you. Thank you.